Greetings and thank you for joining us at futuremoneytrends.com. I have a first time guest, somebody who I've, I've followed going back to 2008, maybe even 2007. Uh, has some of the most popular YouTube videos. Uh, you can check his website out at market-ticker.org. He is the author of Leverage, How Cheap Money Will Destroy the World. He is probably very familiar to everybody listening to this podcast or watching this video on YouTube, Carl Denninger. Carl, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me on. Uh, Carl, just before the show started, we were talking about a little bit about the uh, the roots of the Tea Party uh, certainly, you were there in the very beginning, if not maybe the exact beginning. Uh, but I supported the spirit of the Tea Party. I identify um, as a peaceful, loving anarchist, but uh, someone who would settle for a libertarian government. However, from the very beginning, I have said that I would support Trump, even though I really don't vote, but I would still support him uh, monetarily uh, because the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And I took a lot of heat. And you know you you have uh, you know a, a big following. I know you are you also have a libertarian bent to you. Or and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I just wanted to get your opinion. What what are your thoughts of this election? Because I feel like um, if anything, I'm more I'm more a supporter for Trump now than ever because I'm more anti-Hillary and establishment than ever. I think that's a fair read. Uh, I, I used to be involved with the executive committee of the Libertarian Party of the state of Florida. I was actually on the EC for a while. Um, I resigned during the last election cycle because the party backed Gary Johnson, who is not a libertarian in any sense of the word. And I not only couldn't vote for him, I couldn't support him. And so being that the party at the state level had chosen to support him. I did the only honorable thing that you can do when a group takes a stance you can't support. And I said, I quit. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, you'd be surprised how many people won't do that. Okay. When, you know, when it comes down to it. And yet, uh, you know, I I think that if you're going to be involved with a group and, uh, and, and certainly at that kind of a level that, that you either have to be able to, and be willing to support uh, what that group uh, has is, is they're uh, raising debt right at the point at that particular point in time, or you have to say, you know, it's, it's time to go do something else. Uh, but with that said, in this election, I think we have a a very clear choice. We have two candidates who are both personally very flawed. We know this. Uh, I am I'm no particular fan of of Donald Trump in a number of areas. Uh, however, with that said. What Hillary Clinton has done in her public life, and and I distinguish that from her private life because, frankly, I, I think that if we're, uh, if we're worried about people's private lives first, then we're worried about the wrong things. But what she has done in her public life and the acts that she's taken throughout the years of her public life, and, and remember, she's got a 30-plus year record here to look at. Sure are things that are dangerous and unsupportable from a a anyone that believes in constitutional government. In other words, if if you believe that this country is a constitutional republic, and I remind you, that's that's what it is. You may not want it to be that, but that is what it was founded as, and that's what the Constitution sets forward. If you believe in a constitutional government, that we are a constitutional republic, not a democracy, but a constitutional republic, then the actions that Hillary Clinton has taken over her 30-plus years in public service demonstrate that she does not have any respect for that form of government and that she has actively sought to and has subverted it at every possible turn throughout her time. And so if you put her in office, given these facts, and, and they are facts, then you are essentially voting for the destruction of what is left of our form of government in the United States. I can't do that. Sure. And, you know, does it surprise you that, you know, especially with these Bernie Sanders voters or even, um, you know, you talk to liberals all the time, or at least I do. I was originally from California and, you know, they, they're, they're anti-war. Um, at least they say they are. They, they don't want to see just, uh, you know, constant violence, they don't want to see regimes that are um, intolerant of women. But my goodness, you line Hillary up 
And I don't know how many people have died because of either her voting record or her decisions. You can see in emails with Podesta, she casually talks about, can't we just drone them? I mean, this is really a, 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 an attitude and characteristics of a sociopath. Um, I mean, are you surprised that there's no, um, I mean, she seems, they used to say Donald Trump was Teflon Don. It seems like she is, right? The Clintons have always had, and, and I'm not sure where it comes from, other than the, the liberal progressive bent of a lot of people in this country. Clintons have always had the ability to uh, essentially shoot your mother in the middle of Fifth Avenue in broad daylight and then just blow the smoke out of the barrel of the gun and walk away without consequence. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, it's – and again – the you know the Podesta emails are bad enough. The the stuff that WikiLeaks has disclosed is bad enough. But look, what people say in private is is often a deliberative process and doesn't necessarily reflect on what they intend to do or have done in public. So I, I caution people to be a little careful there because you you know you can read into a private conversation when you only see part of it anything you want. And if you you were able to get your hands on, uh, on on my email archives, which I assure you are much better protected than John Podesta's were, uh, you you would probably be able to go through those and say, "Aha, there it is." All right. But what I look at in in the context of the nation is that Hillary Clinton, during her time as Secretary of State, literally ruined two countries. Okay, she. She was personally responsible for the mess in Libya, and she's personally responsible for what is going on now in Syria with Aleppo, and and the charge that she essentially gave rise to ISIS is true. Yes. Now that's not to say that she isn't the only reason ISIS is around. That's that is taking things too far. However, the fact of the matter is is that we had real bastards, albeit ones that were reasonably stable in both of those countries. And through the policies that she promoted, promulgated, and perfected as Secretary of State, because that was her job, we no longer have those two things. So now we have two nations that have descended into chaos, and we are not at fault, but we are responsible. There's a difference between responsibility and fault. Sure. Uh if Go ahead. You find that what has happened in both Libya and Syria are acceptable, then Hillary Clinton is someone that, from a foreign policy perspective, you can support as president of the United States. If you find those events that occurred in those two nations to be absolutely unacceptable to the extent that we had any part to play in them occurring, you can't vote for her. Uh, last question on that on this issue: Does Trump have a chance? I mean, I thought that he had a chance, and then what we've seen really since the first debate, uh, where I mean, the establishment has, on both sides, uh, Republicans and Democrats, have just in, in an avalanche have done everything they can to crush this guy. I I look at what's going on in in a couple of ways. I don't pay a lot of attention to the headline numbers of the polls. I pay a great deal of attention to the internals and the methodology. And what I see in there alarms me because they are clearly biased and slanted. Now, the pollsters will tell you that they are trying to compensate for what they perceive as sample bias and therefore, you know, essentially level the field. Uh, The problem is, is that I have no way to judge the accuracy of that claim or whether or not they're just trying to make it up so that the numbers say what they want them to say, much like many of the global warming alarmists have done over the years. When they didn't get the results they wanted, they changed the figures. All right, so I am I don't know where the electorate actually is. I can tell you that by looking at the rallies and the number of people who are showing up, uh, Kane goes to Miami and can't manage to get 1,500 people at one of his rallies for Hillary. Um, Pence shows up, and there's 10,000 people that are overflowing the venue. Trump shows up, and the line is four miles down the street. All right, so, you know, I look at these, 
And, and this is not a singular event. This is a pattern over the space of months that goes back to before the primaries were finished and the conventions were held. So if there is any correlation at all with the strength of how people feel about this, then Hillary loses in a landslide. Sure. Okay. But do we have any way to know what people will do when they actually go to vote? The answer is no. Uh, I will just remind those people who think that there's no way Donald Trump can win because of all these polls. The number one, you cannot trust the polling numbers. Number two, they said Brexit was going to fail and it did not. Uh, number three is that I, I think you ought to pay very close attention to a presidential race here in the United States um, of some time ago, and that was Ronald Reagan versus Jimmy Carter. A couple of weeks before the election, every polling organization said Carter had a lock on a second term. We know what actually happened. Sure. Yeah, and, I, you know, it, it is in a weird way, and I'm sure you'll understand this, and anybody listening, should, you probably connect with this. In a weird way, it is politically correct to say you support Hillary. And so if you're polled, it's it's got to affect your answer because even people who love Trump, you know, I don't see as many Trump signs as I saw like George W. Bush back in 2000 or 2004. Um, it's almost politically incorrect to support him. But I imagine when people get in the booth, they will, I mean, the undecideds by a landslide are probably going to go for Trump. Would you Would you agree? I, I don't know. And, and that's always the problem, is that this is, this is an election where I believe that you cannot trust the numbers that are being put forward. You cannot trust the polls. What you, all you can do is, as a voter, pay attention to what, at, what each of these people has actually done in terms of public life, and then consider this to go along with it. You have a record in international politics. We are in a time where international stress is extremely high, although much of it is below the surface. If the world gets into a tough spot, do you want someone who is going to pick up the baseball bat and say, no, you're not going to do it? Or do you want somebody who has both a private and a public position? Sure. And, uh, um, just with this this election in mind, you know, just talk about the economy. Hopefully, it will eventually become a, something they talk about on the actual uh, one of these debates, or the, I guess the last debate tonight. Uh, you are an expert on the economy. You have some of the best analysis out there at market-ticker.org. You've been invited on CNBC. You've been invited uh, to be a keynote at, at conferences. Um, I saw an article yesterday by Zero Hedge. Well, first of all, I'm seeing multiple articles. Seeing global debt is rising. Central banks are accumulating debt at uh, a, 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 a high pace, a faster pace since uh, we've seen about the last four years. And then the next article down is like China and Saudi Arabia are dumping U.S. Treasury. What's going on in the in the global debt market? The global debt market is to a large degree being driven by central bank policy, which in turn is being driven by the fiscal recklessness of governments around the world. You, you probably saw uh, President Obama claim that we ran a $587 billion deficit last year, last fiscal year, which ended on uh, September 30th. That's a lie. We ran a $1.4 trillion deficit. And the way you can discern this is very simple because the Treasury is polite enough to publish every day how much debt is outstanding. Uh, it's called debt to the penny, and you can Google it and go look mm -hmm. it up. And if you look at if you look at those two numbers, subtract one from the other, September thirtieth to September thirtieth, it comes out to one point four trillion dollars. Now, to put a put a, uh, a a context on that, that's about an eight percent currency devaluation over the space of twelve months. Everybody wants to talk about how leverage is rising and it's the banker's fault. It's a, No, 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 folks. It's not the banker's fault. It is the government's fault. And part of the reason you're seeing the establishment so freaked out about Donald Trump's presidency, and unfortunately this has to tie back to politics, but it, it just mm -hmm. does, is that if the Republicans have the presidency, the, the House, and the Senate, there'll be nobody else to blame if it blows up on their watch. Hmm. Now... This is a big problem because last fiscal year, 
we spent $1,417 billion at the federal level between just two programs, and that was Medicare and Medicaid. That was a 9.3% increase over last year's expenditure. That is a pattern that has been more or less unbroken for the last 15, 20 years. And there was a couple of year period where the, the number was much smaller. And a lot of people, a lot of the, the, the pundits trumpeted this. Oh, look, they bent the cost curve with Obamacare and were saved. Well, as it turned out, they didn't do any such thing. They cost shifted, moved things from one fiscal year to another. And the next year it popped right back up. So we are now running at this 9.3% rate. Um, and there's a serious problem here with this because this means that over the next president's term, the spending on those two programs is going to eclipse $2, billion, $2 trillion, $2,000 billion, um, which is an increase of $600 billion a year from where it is today. That $600 billion um, has to be squared against tax receipts. And over the last 12 months, those went up by a paltry 0.55%. So increased revenue would absorb only $72 billion of that spending, which means we would blow more than an additional $500 billion a year hole in the budget deficit. Now, anybody that thinks that we're actually going to get away with that without the Federal Reserve losing the ability to control the long end of the curve is just dead flat wrong. They're crazy. And oh, by the way, in 10 years, the spending on those two programs will eclipse that which the government spends on everything today. Um, so this will end the problem. The entire problem is in the medical industry. The only way to take this on is to prosecute what appear, if you read 15 United States Code Chapter 1, that's collectively Sherman, Peyton, uh, Clayton, and Robinson Patman, mm -hmm. the three primary antitrust acts, it's more than a 100-year-old law. If you read the, that chapter of United States Code and then compare that against what the medical industry does every single day, from pharmaceuticals to hospitals to doctors to buying up MRI practices, all the way down, every one of them is a felony. All of this is arguably a felony. If we do not start locking people up, our government, our way of life, and every asset class, the price of all of them is going to collapse. Now, this, is, this is not a maybe. This is arithmetic. It's not politics. Mm -hmm. And the problem here is that nobody in the political sphere from either party is talking about this. All right. But this, this is where the problem lies. And by the way, if you think it's bad there, at the same time, this is what is bankrupting all of the public sector pensions. Your policeman, a firefighter, a teacher, any of the states, you're not going to get your money. At best, it will be half. I've run the numbers. The best systems in the country right now will be able to pay half of those benefits. Many of them are worse than that. You're going to also see the collapse of all the state budgets for the same reason, because they've got those embedded liabilities. Law or no law, I don't care what your state constitution says you have. If you can't collect the money, you're not going to get the check. Uh, somebody listening to this interview right now, first thing they're thinking of what to do, what to do. And, um, you know, there are two lines of thinking uh, that this would be a deflationary crash, which, which actually makes a lot of sense, uh, and hold cash. But at the same point in time, you're like looking at the currencies you're like, holy crap, do I really want to just hold cash? So you buy some gold. But, uh, you know, either way, you know, it's all going to be volatile. I mean, measuring in fiat currency, of course, it depends, I guess, how you look at it. If you measure your wealth in ounces of gold, measure your wealth in dollar bills. Um, what what should, what is the prudent thing to do right now is, as, is whether you're holding stocks or bonds or gold or cash? What, what do you think the prudent way forward is? Not looking to make profit, just looking to protect. You can't. You, you need to be looking at your wealth in terms of how many chickens are you going to be able to buy or how many gallons of gasoline or how, how many kilowatts, kilowatt hours of electricity because whether or not you have, you know, the number of dollars you have or ounces of gold is utterly immaterial. Uh, <laughs> the only thing that matters is what they buy. Sure. All right. So, so the, the, the problem is 
that the the aspect that people take on this, and I and I get these questions all the time. Whenever I post an article showing showing the math, the first thing that comes up in the comments is, "Well, what do I do as an investor, or what do I do to protect myself from this?" And the answer is, there isn't a way to do it. Remember, the government will steal everything that's not nailed down and not protected with your life. So, unless you're willing to die, um, at which point, of course, you don't care whether you know how much money you have because you're dead. Uh, there is no personal protection method that works. I remind people that thought there was before FDR made gold illegal to privately hold that you could hold all the gold you wanted in your safe, but you could never take it out. And most of the people who tried that died before the 1970s, and they were able to redeem it again. Of course, once you're dead, it doesn't do you any good, right? right. So you need to look at this. It, 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 so the only solution to this problem is political. The only solution to this problem is to force the government to enforce the law. We're not talking about changing laws. We're not talking about doing anything that's unlawful. We're saying what – what I'm saying is – we need to force the government to enforce laws that already exist. And if that means a general strike, an economic, legal economic action, then that's what it means. But if we fail to do that, and instead people try to essentially hide things under the mattress, whatever they may be, you're very likely to fail at that attempt, and you're going to watch your world come crashing down around you. What is, do you see anyone or any websites, obviously your own, uh, advocating real actionable solutions, real coordinated eff efforts by the citizenry? Um, not really. And, and that's the problem is that we're all too worried about whether or not gay people can get married and whether you can have an abortion and whether uh, it should be legal for you to smoke a joint. Uh, you know, guns, gays, God is, uh, is, you know, the three G's is the, is the rights calling card and the left adds a to that. Okay. You know, the abortion issue. Uh, and so, you know, we, we, we argue over stupid things and you just look at, uh, you know, you look at what happened in the last debate, you look at what's going on in the campaign right now. In the meantime, the facts of the matter are that over the last eight years, we've doubled the national debt. We ran a $1.4 trillion deficit last year, and medical spending is out of control, and yet we have within our legal tool book, our, our toolbox today the ability to stop it right now. If there was to be just a handful of indictments, and remember, these are, these are laws, they don't carry civil penalties. You know, There's no slap on the wrist here. This is go-to-jail stuff. If we just had a handful of indictments that were issued over the next month, two months, three months, you would see a crash in the cost of medical care in this country from 80 to 90 percent and a permanent and immediate solution to all of the budget problems and deficits that we have in the United States. Uh, it's very depressing listening to all these issues you brought up, and uh, these debates are spending 90% of the time on uh, the individual's character. Uh, we've run out of time. Carl Denninger, thank you so much for joining us. Everybody, check out his book at Amazon. Uh, again, the book is Leverage, How Cheap Money Will Destroy the World. You can also go to his website, subscribe to his blog at market-ticker.org. That's market-ticker.org. Carl, thanks again for joining us. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Anytime. There he is. Uh, however, with that said, what Hillary Clinton has done in her public life, and and I distinguish that from her private life, because frankly, I, I think that if we're, uh, if we're worried about people's private lives first, then we're worried about the wrong things. But what she has done in her public life and the acts that she's taken throughout the years of her public life. And, and remember, she's got a 30 plus year record here to look at. Sure. Are things that are dangerous and unsupportable from a, a anyone that believes in constitutional government. In other words, if, if you believe that this country is a constitutional republic, and I remind you, that's, that's what it is. You may not want it to be that, but that is what it was founded as, and that's what the Constitution sets forward. If you believe in a constitutional government, that we are a constitutional republic, not a democracy, but a constitutional republic, 
then the actions that Hillary Clinton has taken over her 30 plus years in public service demonstrate that she does not have any respect for that form of government and that she has actively sought to and has subverted it at every possible turn throughout her time. And so if you put her in office, given these facts, and and they are facts, then you are essentially voting for the destruction of what is left of our form of government in the United States. I can't do that. Sure. And, you know, does it surprise you that, you know, especially with these Bernie Sanders voters or even, um, you know, you talk to liberals all the time, or at least I do. I was originally from California. And, you know, they, they're, they're anti-war, um, at least. They- for him, I couldn't support him. And so being that the party at the state level had chosen to support him, I did the only honorable thing that you can do when a group takes a stance you can't support. And I said, I quit. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, you'd be surprised how many people won't do that, okay, when, you know, when it comes down to it. And yet, uh, you know, I, I think that if you're going to be involved with a group and, uh, and and certainly at that kind of a level that that you either have to be able to and be willing to support uh, what that group uh, has is, is their uh, raising debt or at the point at that particular point in time, or you have to say, you know, it's, it's time to go do something else. Uh, but with that said, in this election, I think we have a a very clear choice. We have two candidates who are both personally very flawed. We know this. Uh, I am I'm no particular fan of, of Donald Trump in a number of. Greetings and thank you for joining us at futuremoneytrends.com. I have a first time guest, somebody who I've, I've followed going back to 2008, maybe even 2007, uh, has some of the most popular YouTube videos. Uh, you can check his website out at market-ticker.org. He is the author of Leverage, How Cheap Money Will Destroy the World. He is probably very familiar to everybody listening to this podcast or watching this video on YouTube. Carl Denninger. Carl, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me on. Uh, Carl, just before the show started, we were talking about a little bit about the uh, the roots of the Tea Party. Uh, certainly, you were there in the very beginning, if not maybe the exact beginning. Uh, but I supported the spirit of the Tea Party. I identify um, as a peaceful, loving anarchist, but uh, someone who would settle for a libertarian government. However, from the very beginning, I have said that I would support Trump even though I really don't vote, but I would still support him uh, monetarily uh, because the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And I took a lot of heat. And, you know, you you have, uh, you know, a, a big following. I know you are you also have a libertarian bent to you or and please correct me if I'm wrong. But I just wanted to get your opinion. What, what are your thoughts of this election? Because I feel like um if anything, I'm more I'm more a supporter for Trump now than ever because I'm more anti-Hillary and establishment than ever. I think that's a fair read. Uh, I I used to be involved with the executive committee of the Libertarian Party of the state of Florida. I was actually on the EC for a while. Um, I resigned during the last election cycle because the party backed Gary Johnson, who is not a libertarian in any sense of the word. And I not only couldn't vote.